morning everybody. In this month's webinar, we're still looking at the new IFRS 15 revenue from contracts with customers, but today we are focusing on steps one and two of that new model. You will remember in our previous webinar in June, uh, we looked at an overview of IFRS 15. So welcome to this webinar and I hope you find it informative. Uh, please feel free to contact me, send me questions or your BDO contact person um, afterwards. So the outline of this session, we'll do a, a very high level uh, uh, um, recap of that overview of the five-step revenue model and then in this month we're going to particularly focus on steps one and steps two and then in next month's webinar in August we'll be looking at steps three and four. So we're going into these steps in a little bit more depth uh, today. So step one is to identify the contracts with the customer and to consider the potential combination of contracts and step two is to identify the separate performance obligations. Just a reminder that uh, this is a training item or event, uh, we're raising awareness and it's not formal technical advice. If you do need technical advice please feel free to contact us at BDO. So if we look at the overview of the five-step revenue model, the core principle in the new IFRS 15 is to recognize revenue to depict the transfer of promised goods or services to customers in an amount that reflects the consideration to which the entity expects to be entitled for those goods and services. So there's a few key words in there. So we're looking at promises or performance obligation. We look at there needs to be some consideration. A big emphasis on what the entity expects to be entitled for in exchange for those goods and services. So what is a customer? Because IFRS 15 talks about customers and a customer is a party that has contracted with an entity to obtain goods or services that are an output of the entity's ordinary activities in exchange for consideration. So only when we have a contract with a customer would we recognize revenue. If you have a contract to sell one of your main buildings, um, uh, in that situation it would not meet the definition of a customer, it's not your ordinary activities and therefore it would not lead to the recognition of revenue but instead potentially the recognition of other income. So important that you only recognize revenue um, if it relates to your ordinary activities. This core principle, and by the way, I would expect this core principle to be included in your accounting policy note going forward. So your accounting policy note for revenue recognition would start with this core principle. And then you'll have to say, um, we've identified the following five steps to apply the core principle to our business. And step one is to identify the contracts with a customer and consider the potential combination of those contracts. Step two is to identify the separate performance obligations. Step three is to determine the overall transaction price for this transaction or this contract <coughs> or combination of contracts. Step four is to allocate that total transaction price to the performance obligations identified in step two. And then step five is to recognize the revenue when a performance obligation is satisfied. And we would recognize that revenue either at a point in time or over time, the only two alternatives. So that's a little bit of a recap of what we did in last month's webinar, the core principles and the steps to apply <coughs> the core principle. So let's focus on step one today. Step one, to identify the contracts with the customer and to consider the potential combination of those contracts. So as I said last time, step one has two key parts to it. It's identifying the contract or contracts and then secondly to consider whether we should combine these contracts. 
<coughs> I think it's really important that we understand that the combination of contracts and considering the potential combination of contracts is an integral part of step one and should not be overlooked. So if we look at identifying the contracts with the customer, a number of things. We have to understand that a contract is something that creates enforceable rights and obligations. And that contract can be written, it can be oral, or it could be implied by the entity's business practices. So it doesn't just refer to the written contract. What do we normally do? So our contract doesn't indicate that we provide settlement discounts. However, everybody who deal with us, all our customers, know that normally we provide a settlement discount and therefore that should be considered. Important is that IFRS 15 says that contracts with customers must meet all of the following criteria. So it must be approved by all parties that have to approve the contract in order to make it enforceable. So if we want, an enforce, if we want a contract that uh, creates enforceable rights and obligations, we have to make sure it's been approved by all the relevant parties. The second thing in the yellow block, each party's rights regarding goods and services to be transferred should be identified. So the contract has to be clear on what are every party's... Oh, sorry. I think my mouse has been running on me. I'll just move my mouse. I don't want the running mouse on the table. Um, so each party's rights regarding goods and services to be transferred can be identified from our contracts. Uh, third thing in blue, must have commercial substance. Um, so there's a reason why we're doing it. Uh, it's not just, you know, smoke and mirrors. There's a real commercial substance to the transaction. <clears throat> but note that commercial substance is only one of the six criteria. Uh, the other thing is each party is committed to perform. Uh, now that's a hard thing for an auditor to assess. <clears throat> but we've entered into this transaction. We're committed to perform um, the important one also is the pink one. Payment terms can be identified. And then right on the bottom in the light green, um, uh, uh, something that I want to emphasize, it's probable that the entity will collect the consideration. <coughs> and there we consider the customer's ability and intention to pay. Now that probability is something that could be problematic in practice. So when you enter into a new contract, do you explicitly consider whether it's probable that the entity, the other party, will pay you? Because if it's not probable on day one when you enter into this contract, uh, you don't meet the requirements for a contract in step one, and you can definitely not recognize a revenue. So you can only recognize, or you can only move on to steps two, three, four, five, and potentially recognize revenue in step five, if it's probable that you'll collect the consideration. Now this links back to the standard setter's overall objective uh, that we do not overstate revenue and then after that lower down in the statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income have an expense, a bad debts expense or provision for bad debts. They say, listen, if it's not probable that you're going to collect the consideration, don't book the revenue in the first place. So we shouldn't book the revenue until it's probable. Um, only if it's probable we'll book it. Yes, if circumstances change years later uh, or many months later and that amount is not uh, collectible, that's a different thing. That's a provision for bad debts or that's potentially a bad debts. But before you book revenue, there's an explicit requirement to consider whether it's probable that we'll collect it. So that's very important. So whatever we have on this slide, um, we could uh, 
change into a decision tree, you know by now that I like decision trees. And you could say in step one, if I want to consider um, and identify the contract or contracts with the customer, we can just reorder what we had on the previous slide and say, okay, step one, have the parties approve the contract. If we say yes, can the entity identify each party's rights regarding the goods or services? Yes. Can we identify payment terms? Yes. Does the contract have commercial substance? So does it change the risk timing on amount of the entity's future cash flows? Uh, yes. And then the last one, is it probable? So more likely than not, more than 50% likely that the entity will collect the consideration to which it will be entitled in exchange for goods or services. If you say yes to all of those questions, you can account for this contract under IFRS 15 and you move on to the second part of step one and hopefully to the rest of the steps. And remember, you only recognize revenue in step five. If you say no to any of these questions, it means you do not have a contract in terms of IFRS 15 or for IFRS 15 purposes, and therefore you cannot move on and definitely you'll not be able to recognize revenue. So that's a very important thing. I've often been asked, or, or I am often asked, um, do we have to reassess whether we have a contract? So if you, the first thing is, do we meet all criteria for a contract at inception? And remember when I talk about a contract, it's a contract for IFRS 15 purposes. So legally, we might have a contract. Do we have a contract for IFRS 15 purposes? That could be different than the legal answer. Because to have a contract for IFRS 15 purposes, we have to look at the decision tree on the previous slide. Um, and we have to meet all of those before we have a contract. So do we meet all the criteria for a contract for IFRS 15 purposes at inception? If we say yes, then you'll only reassess that if the facts and circumstances change in future. If you say no, I don't have a contract, therefore I cannot move on to the next part of step one and step two, etc., then you will continue to reassess to determine whether you meet the criteria because you'll only move on and potentially recognize revenue once you meet the criteria. So it's a continuous process of reassessment. Very important, no contract means no revenue unless the cash is received. And again, we'll talk about that. So I'm going to look at an example. So what are the accounting entries where there's no contract? So we've looked at the decision tree and there's no contract. What do we do now? So in this example, I've said ABC sells goods to Peter Jones for one million on the 1st of January 2018. And ABC has conducted uh, business with Peter Jones for many years and has always received payment in full. However, ABC is aware that Peter Jones' business um, is in an area affected by bushfires and as such he may experience difficulty paying um, this amount. So circumstances have changed. Past experience he, always, he has always paid. In the current year we know circumstances has changed. We have to take that into consideration. Therefore, ABC assesses that it's not probable, so it's less than 50%, that they will receive uh, the full one million. Um, assume that he eventually pays for the goods on the 1st of June 2018. So when we sell the goods to him, deliver the goods to him on the 1st of January, we're not sure. We don't think it's probable that we'll get it. However, five months later, we do receive the cash. How do we account for it? I think before we look at the journal entries, a number of clients have asked me, Aleda, we would not sell goods to Peter Jones on credit if we don't think it's probable that they'll pay us. So we think we implicitly meet this requirement. I would, however, question how do we prove that? How do we document that? Do you have, have a formal process where you do creditworthiness assessment of new 
a customer, and even if it's an existing customer, what if Peter Jones owes us a lot of money for previous um, goods that we've provided to him? Let's say if we look at the Peter Jones um, aging in our debtors book, we can see that um, you know he, he, he's sitting in 180 days. Uh, compare that to normally people pay us within 30 days or 60 days. Peter Jones is sitting in 180 days. If we decide to continue, continue to sell to him, which is a business decision, not arguing with that, you're going to continue to sell to him, although he owes you a lot of money, which is more than 180 days. Question is, can we still say it's probable that he'll pay us for this? And what have we done to assess it, to assure it? So I think the new IFRS 15 would force us to document, consider, is it probable? So if we go back to this question and the assumptions we've made here, on the 1st of January, when we sell the goods to Peter Jones, we deliver the goods, we will book a receivable because we want to, I mean, he owes us the money, we want to send him invoices, we want to remind him that he owes us the money. So debit a receivable and will credit a, li a liability as required by IFRS 15. So we're not going to say debit a receivable credit revenue um, because we don't know if it's probable that we'll get that money. So it can't be revenue. The only other alternative, it has to be a liability. <coughs> so we're not booking the revenue, but we have the receivable. We also have delivered the inventory. So you have to say credit the inventory and debit cost of uh, goods sold. So whatever that amount is, I didn't provide it in this example. So in a way, if you think about the impact on your profit and loss at this stage, just after you've processed these two journals, you do not have a revenue, but you've got an expense, cost of goods sold. And if you look at your balance sheet, uh, you no longer have the inventory, uh, yes, you've got a receivable, but you also have a corresponding liability. Um, so we, we don't know uh, whether they'll ultimately pay this. And then on the 1st of June, very happy, they pay us. So we say debit cash, credit the receivable, they no longer owe us the money. And also that liability can now be transferred to revenue because the revenue, it's now probable that we'll receive the cash. We've actually received the cash. Please note, as we've said earlier, between the 1st of January and the 1st of June, we will continually reassess to determine whether we meet the six criteria for a contract. Specifically, we'll reassess whether we think it's now probable that we'll receive this million dollars. So it could have been that in March or in April already, we thought it's probable. And then at that stage, we would have said debit the liability credit revenue. So that could have happened. Now, in my scenario, you would say, if we had a 30 June year end, no problem. Uh, why is this an issue? It would have been an issue if we had a year end 31 March, uh, or if the financial reporting date was between the date we've delivered the goods and the date we've actually received the cash. So that's just an, a simple example to illustrate that point. I think the other thing to be very clear about, and it's from IFRS 15, if cash, if cash are received in advance, um, but we do not meet any of the other or some of one of the other contract criteria, um, even though we receive the cash, we cannot recognize the revenue. I cannot overemphasize that cash receipt does not equal recognition of revenue. And the day that we receive the cash does not automatically mean we recognize revenue. We have to apply the five steps. And the five steps do not refer to cash received at any stage. So there is this misconception that if I receive cash up front and it's non-refundable, um, we recognize revenue at that stage? No. So when would we recognize revenue in that situation? You've recognized the cash, um, you've received it, it's non-refundable. Um, you would say, I only recognize the revenue when the contract is terminated and the consideration is non-refundable, or the entity has no remaining obligations and substantially all the consideration 
has been received. If you look at that yellow block, the contract has been terminated and the consideration is non-refundable. I'll give you an example. Let's say you've received cash and the cash says you're going to provide um, goods or services uh, to a client over the next 12 months. Let's say we've determined um, you know, the cash that you've received is non-refundable. Let's say we go through the whole uh, process, for example, um, and we say, listen, we're not meeting some of these other criteria, therefore the cash is sitting there, debit cash, credit liability. Um, because it's non-refundable, it doesn't mean you can recognize the revenue on day one. We'll only recognize the revenue when we do meet all of the criteria for the contract and we've stepped through all the steps in the process or the contract is terminated. So three months later they say, listen, we're going to terminate this contract. We don't want this contract anymore. At that stage you say to them, listen, but I'm not going to give you your cash back. It's non-refundable. At that stage the contract has been terminated. You don't have to give the cash back. At that stage you can say debit liability credit revenue. Right, so you need that contract to be terminated before you can say even non-refundable cash is actually revenue. So very important. Another example um, around identifying the contract. Um, background information, let's say manufacturing company sells widgets to a hardware store for $100. Now before completing the sales contract, a manufacturing company performs credit checks, a checks to assess hardware stores ability to pay and they do conclude that they have the ability uh, to pay and they accept them as a customer and they do think that collection is probable. Um, they also um, assess or, or state, you know, manufacturing company usually when they sell goods in general they receive 95% uh, of the amounts billed. That's in general. Um, and all other criteria for a contract has been met. So the question is, is there a contract with a customer in this situation? And if so, how much revenue could be recognized on this contract? So do you think we've got a contract? I think based on this information, um, we've assessed the collection probability, there's nothing else indicating, we don't have all the information necessarily, but I do think we will be able to say yes, um, you know, there's a, let's assume there's a signed contract, payment terms are clear, rights and obligations are clear, um, we've looked at credit checks, we think that it's more than probable, more than 50% chance of collecting the money, so there's a contract with a customer. The issue now is, uh, what amount could potentially be recognized as revenue in this situation? And the, the confusing bit is the contract here is for $100 and we know this client usually pays, um, but we've got the statement that in general, if you look at all their sales, all their credit sales, usually they only collect 95%. So should we take that into consideration, that general statement, when we recognize revenue from this particular customer? And the answer is that you look at this situation at the particular customer, based on past experience, this particular customer pays you in full, and therefore will recognize the revenue as $100. And we would not consider that general statement. Um, I do point at the bottom there, if we had expectation or past experience or there's been a change in circumstances that hardware store might not pay the full amount or if we know that we would provide a settlement discount that which they would potentially use, um, in step three when we look at the transaction price, um, if, there's there, if there is that variable consideration, we would potentially take that into account. At this stage, that general statement about all clients definitely is not enough. Uh, when we get to step three, we'll investigate a bit further. So yes, we've got a contract and potentially recognize the whole hundred. So some practical, practical implications if you look at step one and particularly identifying a contract. It's very important 
uh, that we ask some questions. Do we have a customer that's purchasing output from our ordinary activities? It's very important that in our statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income, we clearly distinguish between revenue from transactions with customers in ordinary activities as opposed to other income. So that's important. The other thing, the second bullet point, is we need to determine whether right at the start we've got a contract and the key thing there, if it is probable that we'll collect the consideration. If it's not probable, we don't even have a contract, no revenue recognised. So it's important that we consider credit checks and what our process is around new customers, even existing customers, uh, managing bad debts and outstanding bad debts, how long they've been outstanding, at what point do we stop to continue to sell to them. And then there could be a system and process changes required at your organisation. Uh, so to consider that within step one. If we still look at step one but we look at the second part, which is the potential combination of contracts, it's important to say that you combine two or more contracts if they entered into at or near the same time and if they entered into with the same customer or a related party of that customer. So already those two aspects are quite subjective and judgmental. So at the same time or near the same time, what does that mean for your business um, and the um, how you usually contract, enter into negotiations, um, would it be same time as within the same week, is it within the same month. Um, also to update systems and to be aware of transacting with a customer and also related party or parties of a customer. So to have that awareness and maybe asking the question when you enter into a contract, do we think about uh, where the customers are related parties, uh, do we negotiate uh, with related parties together um, or do they negotiate with us together to get a better price or a better deal and, and how does that impact our revenue recognition in terms of IFRS 15. Uh, so in order to combine a contract you need number one entered into the contract at the same time or near the same time. Number two, it should be with the same customer or related party of that customer and number three, you should meet one of the following criteria and there's three so you just have to tick one of them. Um, so it is, has it been negotiated as a package? Um, so contracts have been negotiated as a package with a single commercial objective or uh, the consideration are interdependent or the amount of consideration to be paid in one contract depends on the price or the performance in another related contract. Um, or single performance obligation that there are goods and services promised across a number of contracts but actually they relate to a single performance obligation. Um, an example of that is if I want to renovate a uh, if I want somebody to build a home for me and instead of just uh, signing a contract, please build a brand new home for me. I split it up in 10 contracts, build a bedroom, build a living room, build a dining room, build a kitchen. In that instance, it's quite clear that it's one single performance obligation, build me a home. Um, and the fact that we legally split it into a number of contracts is irrelevant for the purposes of IFRS 15. There could be other reasons why they've split it in different legal contracts, but for accounting purposes, IFRS 15 purposes, uh, we look through that. So if we take this slide again with this information and we convert it into a decision tree, we would say when would we combine contracts? Number one, are the contracts entered into at or near the same time? As discussed on the previous slide, yes. Are the contracts with the same customer or related parties with the customer? Yes. So if you answer yes to both of those, if you answer yes to any of the next three questions, you will combine. If you answer no to any of them, no combination of contracts. Um, are the contracts negotiated as a package with a single objective? Yes, combine. Does the amount in one contract uh, depend on the price or performance in another, yes, combine. 
Um, is it a single performance obligation that's split across a number of um, contracts? Yes, combine. So this decision tree is just putting this previous slide slightly differently. So let's look at an example to illustrate this. And I've got two examples. So the first one is um, build a company enters into two separate agreements with a customer. The first agreement says we have to deliver bricks to you and you're going to pay $100. And agreement two says we're going to build a wall for customer X for $10. And the normal price for construction of a wall is $100. So that's a standalone selling price. So how should the builder account for these two contracts? And I think it's important that we say quite often, and we don't know the situation, but quite often a customer would come to a builder and there's a single performance obligation so we would like you to come and build a wall in the front of our house. That's what we want, single commercial objective and therefore a single um, performance obligation. And there's a price interdependency between the two. We realize that the builder will do two things. The builder will deliver bricks and yes, then the builder will bring builders out there and they'll build a wall. Um, and for whatever reason, the builder has put it in two different agreements. But the substance of what's going on here is that these two contracts should be combined because there's a single commercial objective and therefore it should just be one contract. So that's important. We treat it as one. Now you might ask, a letter what's going on? Why do we have to combine it? What's the impact? It wouldn't lead to the same answer anyway. So I've prepared an example to illustrate the potential impact. Now let's say we've got a builder and they're going to do renovations at a customer. And the builder entered into three contracts with the same customer or related party, man, uh, husband and wife, doesn't matter. Um, or, um, and um, it's entered into, let's say, in this, uh, more or less at the same time. So we tick the first two criteria. And the room to be renovated, contract one refers to the kitchen, contract two refers to the bathroom, and contract three refers to the media room. And in the contract, we've stipulated contract prices. And in con contract one, we've said the contract price for the kitchen is $80,000, and for the bathroom, $10,000, and the media room, $10,000. So the contract price across the three contracts will add up to $100,000. Let's say the standalone selling prices, so market prices, standalone selling price, normally if we had to do a renovation of a similar kitchen, it would be $30,000, a similar bathroom, $20,000, um, and a similar media room, $50,000. And the expected date of completion of contract one is June 2017, uh, contract two is October 2018, and contract three is November 2018. So there's a big time delay. So in this instance, the entity's year end is 30 June. So if these contracts are not combined, and if we've decided it's three separate contracts, and if we assume that contract one is completed by 30 June as expected, then the entity would have recognized the builder would have recognized in their 30 June financial statements revenue of the contract price of 80000 because they would have just looked at that one contract in isolation. The other two contracts will only be included in the 30 June 2019 revenue numbers. If the contracts were combined because it was with the same customer, uh, it was at the same time and there's interdependencies and price interdependencies and we've combined the three and we said, all right, this is one contract. The total transaction price in step three is $100,000. Step four, we allocate the total transaction price based on standalone selling prices. And then in step five, we recognize revenue when we um, do the different performance obligations. Yes, we've got three performance obligations, kitchen, bathroom, media room. If we did all of that with the combined contracts, the revenue recognized in the 30 June financial statements, 30 June 2017 financial statements, would only have been $30,000. So there's a big difference whether we're combining the contracts or we're keeping the contracts separate. And this is all to make sure 
that entities are not creating all these separate contracts and stating specific contract prices in contracts that are not related to standalone selling prices. And the reason that happens is that we load the initial contracts, high contract price, because we expect it to be completed earlier <coughs> so we can book the revenue. Right, so it's important that we look through that, combine these contracts, identify separate performance obligations, allocate total transaction price of 100,000 over the three performance obligations based on standalone selling prices. So this um, example I think illustrates that point uh, beautifully. So if we look at combining contracts, which is the second part of step one, <coughs> for every contract we have to consider whether it is linked with another contract. So it's a critical aspect when we look at revenue recognition to consider the potential linking and therefore potential combination of contracts for the purposes of ASB 15 and for revenue recognition. It could have a big impact as seen in example 4. And then again, it could lead to system and process changes because we now have to <coughs> consider transactions with the same customer, related parties, um, uh, bundled contracts, uh, and how do we account for that. So that's step one. I thought I would get your input at this stage and get an idea of to what extent you use these. So let's uh, look at a poll. My first question, um, to do a little bit of informal research, is do your organization um, currently perform credit checks on new customers? So just a, 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 an idea. So this is assuming you have credit sales. Um, you know, do you do some kind of credit check as would be required under the new IFRS 15? So let's see. Oh, a lot of people have already voted. Uh, we're looking at 48% um, of people have voted. The others, we're really interested in, in your view or what you currently do. Um, fastest fingers first. So very interesting. We're nearly there. Few more people to, to participate. We've got so many people involved. It would be really interesting to have a look at this. All right, so we're looking at 61% uh, of you have voted, so let's see uh, what this looks like. If you look at the poll results, 34% um, of you said yes, which is really interesting. 29% sometimes, so it depends, I suppose, on, I assume, um, the risk associated or the amount or the perceived risk of the client. 27% says no. Uh, it might be they don't uh, do it because they haven't had bad experiences or they deal with people known to them or maybe they should consider and 10% unsure. So very interesting to have a look at that I must say, very interesting. What about uh, if we look alright, so you're looking Let's look at another question. Do your organization uh, currently consider the potential combination of contracts? So is that part of your thinking? Is it embedded in your processes? Um, I mean, it's a requirement in the new um, IFRS 15. It would be interesting to what extent that's already part of your processes, your thinking, um, Right. Again, thank you very much for everybody that's voting. It's much appreciated. I mean, even if you don't know, just I'm sure that's fine. It's just a really informal kind of assessment to what extent this is something that, um, you know, you've got or our clients have under control um, or whether we should, you know, do a bit more thinking about that area. Again, it looks as if we've got, we, we nearly hit the 60% of you that's voted. Thank you very much. If the last few people could, could uh, vote, that would be great. Nearly there. 
you know, we need at least 60% of the attendees and then we can say it's a, a proper research. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much. Um, so in this instance, uh, 12 of you said yes, we already consider it. 27% um, sometimes. Um, I suppose it would be if we we're aware of related parties, there were negotiations. 46% no, so that's something to build into processes while we get ready for IFRS 15 and 15% unsure. So thank you very much for participating in those. So we had two questions uh, after we've looked at step one and throughout step two I'll ask you another two questions. Um, so I, step two is around identifying separate performance obligations. So here we've assumed that we've met the criteria for a contract in step one and if we had to combine contracts we've already done that. Now we've got everything together and we say okay in step two identify the separate performance obligations. Now what is a performance obligation? In plain English a performance obligation is what have we promised to provide to the customer? What goods have we promised to, to provide to the customer? What services have we promised to provide to the customer? So it could be a good or a service or a bundle of goods or services that's distinct or it could be a series of goods or services that are substantially the same, have the same pattern of transfer and therefore we bundle them together as a, as a distinct series of goods or services. So if we, why is it important? Um, if the good or service is distinct, if we say yes, then it's a separate performance obligation. If it's not distinct, we bundle it with similar or other goods or services until we've got a distinct good or service or a distinct series of goods and services. So I always say this reminds me a bit to what we do with impairment testing on cash generating units uh, where we would say, um, you know, look at doing payment testing for each assets that have its own cash flows. If, it, if an asset doesn't have its own cash flows, group it together with other assets until you've got a cash generating unit or, um, or a group of assets that together provide their own cash flows. So that's an important, it's a similar requirement. Then, um, also another question that I'm often asked, are the poor performance obligations always explicitly stated? And the answer is no. Uh, you know, the promises don't have to be explicitly stated in a contract. It could be implied by the entity's customary business practices or by policies or by specific statements and that, that creates a valid expectation. So an example here is uh, we have a contract to provide software licenses to a customer and we don't specifically state in the contract that we will provide support or after-sales support or that we would um, run a help desk. However, clients know if they contact us based on past experience, we always help them. <coughs> if they've got queries, we help them, we sort it out, we don't charge them. Therefore, there's an implicit uh, performance obligation within that contract. Although it's not stated, they've got a valid expectation, customers have a valid expectation that will assist them with support issues over the next year or so or while they use our software license. So that's something to be aware of, that it's not just things explicitly stated in the contract or explicitly verbally agreed but also um, implied based on past experience, expectations. So what is a distinct good or a service? Now IFRS 15 says you have a distinct good or service when both of the following criteria are met. <coughs> the first one is we have a customer that can benefit from a good or a service either on its own or with other resources available to the customer. Um, so that is an, an important one. Um, so, you know, we can, sorry, we, I've accidentally pressed the mouse, the mouse is not running this time. Um, the customer can benefit, benefit from this good or service either on its own or with other regularly available resources. 
So that's the first thing. But that's only the first criteria. You have to say yes to both of these. A lot of people just focus on the one criteria and forget about the other. So can the customer benefit from it on its own? Um, or, you know, by or not on its own, but together with other things they already have in place. And the other um, criteria is the entity's promise to transfer the good or service is separately identifiable from other promises in the contract. Um, so if you cannot separately identify it, it's not a distinct good or, or, or service. That's with um, if you are saying, I'm building a wall. It's not a separately identifiable performance obligation to deliver bricks and then to come and build the wall. It's one performance obligation. It's the nature of the promise is one thing. The nature of my promise is to build the wall. Yes, it will include different activities, but my promise is I'll build the wall. Nowhere did I say, yes, I'll deliver bricks and a separate thing, I'll come and build the wall. My promise is the nature of my promise is to build the wall. Uh, or to build the house, or to build a stadium. Um, so in that, two things. Can they benefit from it all, on their own? But also, you know, what is the nature of our promise? Is the nature of the promise uh, to deliver bricks and integrate the bricks into a wall or not? And that's the tricky one. So if we look at the nature of the promise, the second aspect, two examples, your first option we could say the nature of my promise is to transfer each good or service individually. So I sell you bricks, I deliver the bricks, end of story. The other option is I have, um, the nature of my promise is to transfer a combined set of items um, and yes, there are a number of inputs into this combined promise. Um, but you know, I agree to build a wall, I agree to build a house, um, and that's my promise. Um, if they build a house, yes, they'll deliver bricks and windows and wood and roof tiles and cabinet, cabinetry. Um, but ultimately, the promise from the property uh, or, the, or the builder is to build a house. So it's one promise. This one is the tricky one. This is the one where judgment is required. This is one where we have to think very carefully. So if we convert that into a decision tree, the first question is, can the customer benefit from the good or service, whether on its own or with other readily available resources? If you say no to that, then, you know, it's not distinct. You have to combine it with other things. If you say yes to that, remember there's the second part. And the second part, I've not just put one question here, consider the nature. I've actually broken that considering the nature of the promise into three distinct parts to try and assist you. But the, the substance of these three questions are, what's the nature of your performance obligation? So the three questions that we've put in there from IFRS 15 is, does the entity provide a significant service of integrating the goods or services? Because if you're providing a significant service of integrating these goods or services, um, then one would say, um, you know, it's not distinct. It's not distinct and it should be combined with the actual goods and services. Um, if we say, no, I'm not integrating it, you go on, you say, do one or more of the goods or services significantly modify or customize uh, or, uh, are, 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 or are significantly modified or customized by the goods or services? If you say yes, again, then it can't be distinct. So as soon as you are modifying um, assets um, of, the, of the customer or installing something that is software that's modifying the, the um, current systems, one could say that's not distinct. And there are the goods or services highly interdependent or highly interrelated. That's the building the wall, building the house. You can't separate them. So if you say yes to any of those, then you can't say you've got one distinct performance obligation. You have to combine it with other things. So let's look at examples uh, to illustrate that. Sorry, before we look at the examples, some potential issues in practice. And this step is particularly difficult and particularly judgment. And we have to think about this carefully, identifying separate performance obligations. You have to think whether or not 
a good or a service or a bundle of goods or services is distinct. Um, you know, in, and specifically it's relevant in, in certain uh, industries or entities like software and technology, construction and retail. <coughs> but in all entities, uh, consider whether you've got bundles um, of goods or services and whether in those bundles of goods or services you should bundle all of them together into one performance obligation or whether you should unbundle it into separate performance obligations for the purposes of IFRS 15. I would say here be particularly careful if you are providing certain things for free. If, your, if you or um, your clients are providing services or goods for free, uh, you know, that should be a red flag. It's a potential separate performance obligation should be treated separately for IFRS 15 purposes. And then uh, the other practical issue or potential issue in practice is whether or not the goods or services are indeed separable from each other. In particular, the de degree of customization that's required, the degree of integration that's required at the customer's premises and interdependencies. Um, so this is again something to be quite aware of. So if I look at an example to illustrate this, a fairly simple example, um, let's say Mr. Y subscribes to a 12-month magazine subscription and receives a free watch. How many performance obligations do we have in this contract? And let's say all of this is within one contract. So there's a magazine subscription. What do we promise? Um, we are promising to provide the magazine every month, let's say for the next 12 months, but they'll also receive a free watch. Therefore, we have to ask, are the magazines and the watch separate or is it one performance obligation? Now, in this instance, I would think there are two performance obligations. The one is to provide the 12 monthly magazines over 12 months and the other is to provide a watch and let's assume the watch is on day one. Some people tell me, Aleta, I think there's actually 13 performance obligations because I have to pr provide a magazine each month and therefore I've got 12 performance obligations and then also I have a watch which is the 13th one. I suppose that is taking it really far. Uh, you could say that the magazine subscription, the 12 months, is a series of distinct goods or services. So yes, there's one series of magazines and then there's the watch. So that's how, how I get to the two separate performance obligations. Practical implications in this instance, if you've treated it as one performance obligation, uh, you would have recognized your revenue evenly over the 12 months as you provide the magazine to your customer. In this instance, because the watch is a separate performance obligation and provided to the customer on day one, you would recognize the revenue in respect of the watch or the part of the transaction price allocated to the watch on day one and the rest over the 12 months. Um, it's important that we determine the standalone selling price of the watch and the magazines. So that is what we'll do in step four and we'll discuss that in our next webinar next month. And again, do we have the systems to track the two revenue items? So if entities are currently just grouping this together as one performance obligation, spreading it over 12 months, will they have the systems and the procedures in place to separate the two? There's a watch and then there's magazines. Another example here, Let's say a um, machine company enters into a contract to sell a machine to service company. Uh, let's say this machine needs to be installed but can be, can be installed by anyone. So installation is not a complex process. Um, machine company identifies two performance obligations and they say, listen, we'll sell you a machine and then we'll also um, um, send our installation people and they can install it for you. So in this instance, if you think whether it's two performance obligations, um, the entity could just take the machine and get somebody else to install it. So they could use the machine with other readily available resources. They don't need us. And also, um, 
you know, we have clearly said it's not just one performance obligation. We've said these two things we'll provide to you and we provide you quotes and prices for the different things. Um, so therefore we've got the two performance obligations. A last example on separate performance obligations <coughs> is example seven. So let's say entity B sells printing equipment to Mr. A and the printing equipment is off the shelf. So no customization or modification is required um, as part of the installation process. However, specialized consumables are required to be used with the equipment. So um, we deliver the printing equipment and you have to use certain uh, cartridges to do your printing with and we'll provide that to you uh, and we'll provide certain amounts or volumes based on past experience every six months. So how many performance obligations are in this contract? So the issue really is do we take the printer that we sell and the consumables and say it's one performance obligation or would it be two? So again one would say you know we sell the printer to you and you could use that printer with consumables that you buy from other entities um, or other distributors. Uh, the other thing is we are saying we're selling a, 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 the machine to you and we will provide consumables to you every six months. Um, you know, so we've got two distinct promises in here. One, here's the machine. Number two, we'll give you consumables. So the nature of the promise is two separate promises. Um, so if you look at the two performance obligations, so it's the printing equipment and the consumables, Mr. A can benefit from the printing equipment and the consumables on their own. So they can get, use the consumables with a printer obtained from somebody else or they could use the machine and get consumables from somebody else. Contractually, they're going to get it from us, but if there weren't this contract in place, they could have gone somewhere else. Um, we promise to transfer the consumables over the three-year contract period and so it's a, a series of distinct promises and every six months as we provide the consumables we'll recognize a bit of revenue and there's no integration or modification required um, and the printing equipment and the consumables are not highly interrelated. So if we made a promise to deliver a machine and we have to do installation of the machine. Only us can do the installation and this machine has to be integrated with the rest of the machines within the factory um, and there's a lot of customization involved. We wouldn't say the sale of a machine and the installation is two separate performance obligations and because there's too many customization etc involved. So in that instance it would be one performance obligation. So Still in step two, I thought in this webinar I'll give you two specific examples and I know my time is out so I'll try and do it fairly fast. In step two there's two particular areas that require particular attention. Sorry, before I go on to that, um, let's just, before we look at warranties, I thought maybe let's get an idea and, and run a poll question. And the poll question I want to ask this time is do your organization enter into bundled contracts that include a number of separate performance obligations? Um, so just by listening at this webinar, do you have a sense for whether you actually include uh, enter into bundled transactions and that you going forward will have to unbundle them into separate performance obligations? So just a little bit of a sense. Thank you very much again for all of those voting. I appreciate that. Um, I find it interesting to see um, what people are doing, what they're dealing with. Um, I'm sitting on my technical cloud at BDO, so it's really interesting to have a little bit of feedback from your side. So at this stage, again, um, we've got around, yeah, 52 people have voted, so let's see. Uh, what they've said. So 28% said yes, we enter into bundled contracts, 23% sometimes, so we'll have to be careful there to, to be aware that we should identify separate promises. 38% um, no, so this wouldn't be an issue for them going forward and 11% unsure, so we still have to think about that a bit. 
So if we look at an example, and I want to look at um, warranties, <coughs> and I want to look at a material right. So that's the two examples I want to consider. So currently, if you sell a good and you also provide a warranty to your customer with that good, you would account for that warranty as a provision for warranties in terms of ISB 137, provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent assets. <coughs> so what would happen is you would sell the washing machine, let's say for $100, you'll book the revenue of $100, and then you'll say, I've provided a warranty based on past experience, what is the probability, likelihood, magnitude if people come back and they want us to repair um, this um, washing machine. And you create a provision for warranty. So you book the, the revenue of 100 and then you say debit uh, provision for warranty expense and credit a provision for warranty of let's say $20. Uh, so as you can see, you've got revenue the total 100 and you've got this expense of 20. Now the standard is saying um, if that warranty is indeed a separate performance obligation. Uh, on day one, you would potentially only book revenue of 80, and that other 20, 20 that the customer paid for the warranty, you will have a deferred revenue or a liability, and only transfer it to revenue over the period of the warranty. So in that situation, we would not have a provision for warranty because it's a separate performance obligation. So it's really important if you are selling goods and providing warranties that we assess whether going forward you'll continue to apply ASB 137, which is an option, or whether you'll treat it as a separate performance obligation and therefore you'll have to defer the recognition of your revenue. So again, a decision tree to try and help you with that. So does the customer have an option of purchasing the warranty separately? If you say yes, then definitely it's a service warranty and it's a separate performance obligation. If the customer doesn't have an option to purchase the warranty separately, it comes with the, the, the sale automatically, the next question you have to answer is, does the warranty provide the customer with additional service in addition to the assurance that this product will function as specified? So is it just a normal warranty? or is there an additional aspect to it? The additional aspect uh, would be a service warranty and a separate performance obligation, and the normal part of it will just be a normal assurance warranty, and you'll continue to recognize it within ASB 1 through 7. So you'll see that certain warranties will be a service warranty, and it's a separate performance obligation, defer revenue recognition. Other warranties could be Assurance warranty, we continue to do what we currently do. Or you can have a warranty that have a bit of both in them. So how do you make that assessment if we think about it a little bit more? You know, is it a separate performance obligation or not? You use the decision tree, but you also consider the following things, which is outlined in IFRS 15. You would consider, is the warranty required by law? Uh, if it's, uh, you know, if it's required by law, uh, usually it's just a normal assurance warranty. The length of the warranty period, usually the longer the warrant period, uh, the more likely that it's a separate performance obligation. And then also you consider the nature of the task that you have to perform in terms of the warranty. So if you are just saying, listen, you can return it and uh, we'll fix it, um, you know, or we provide return shipping for defect, uh, defective pro um, products, etc. And uh, then, usually in that situation, it would not be a separate performance obligation. So there's no clear-cut rules here, judgment uh, around whether you've got an assurance obligation or whether you've got a service obligation. So I would look at this decision tree in the first instance, and then also consider when you get to this box. Does the warranty provide additional service? Also consider these aspects. Um, the other aspect that I would like to look at is options with a material right. So this is very similar to what we currently have um, in um, Interpretation 13, Customer Loyalty Programs. So if you sell goods to your customer, um, is there 
implied or explicitly included an option that provides a material right to acquire additional goods or services at a discount. So if they have the option to buy more goods at the normal standalone selling price, it's not a material right, not a separate performance obligation. If it gives it to them at a discount and it gives them a material right, um, you know, then they are effectively paying for something in advance and therefore you should defer the recognition of revenue. So that is when I fly to Sydney and I'm going to Hobart tomorrow, my first time to Hobart, very excited. Um, you have to say, um, there's, you know, when I buy my flight, I'm not just paying for my flight to Hobart tomorrow. A part of it is for my frequent flyer points that I can use later in the year to go to Queensland, my favourite holiday destination in Australia, nice warm weather, I go to Nisa, um, you know, so I'm actually paying for a little bit of that ticket as well. So I should defer revenue recognition until I get on the plane to Queensland. Um, it also happens in other instances where... Um, you sell goods um, and there's some kind of come back and we'll give you a discount or come back and you can, um, you know, get $30 free. Um, there's some discount options. So very important to consider when you sell something where there's, whether there's something else included in the sale where revenue should be deferred or the recognition of revenue should be deferred. So if you look at those options with a material right, it's in the application guidance. Question is, is the option to acquire the additional goods or services at a standalone selling price for the goods or services? If it is at a standalone selling price, it's not a material right and it's not a separate performance obligation. If we provide them an option to come and buy something that's below the standalone selling price, uh, we should consider, um, you know, if it's a material a benefit that they're getting and if it is it's a separate performance obligation we would defer revenue recognition until they either use that discount or that option expires. Um, so I've given you an example on uh, identifying performance obligations saying you know we sell a washing machine there's a 12-month warranty in it standard you can't buy it separately you also have extended warranty in there, um, so you can buy that separately and it gives you additional service. So you can see in my example, I'm trying to lead you that there's an assurance warranty uh, where you create a provision, but there's also a service warranty, which is a separate performance obligation. <coughs> I'm saying there's free repair and maintenance services, so that's a separate performance obligation. You get washing power for free and there's also a discount voucher so a 50% discount. So there's a number of performance obligations in this example. So I have five. Just to give you an idea to what extent we have to look at a transaction and split it into the separate performance obligations and the impact it would have on revenue recognition and potentially deferring revenue recognition. <coughs> so practical implications, do we identify separate performance obligations? Do we determine whether goods and services are distinct? Um, do we assign values to these separate performance obligations? Uh, most likely in this situation, if there's more performance obligations than we currently have, most likely we're going to defer revenue recognitions. And again, um, can our system deal with tracking of five different performance obligations? Before I close off, I'll ask you a final question. I thought it would be interesting to ask you, um, do you or do your organization currently provide warranties uh, to your customers when you provide service or when you sell goods? Are there any warranties in there? Um, and therefore, we'll have to consider you know, whether it's a normal assurance warranty or whether, whether there's a service warranty, which is a separate performance obligation. Again, just want to get some idea um, from the attendees, how many of you actually provide warranties. Thank you very much. Close to 50% voted. Let's see if we can get to 50, 55, 60%. What do you think? Um, at the moment, we're looking at about 17% are saying yes, we're providing warranties. Uh, quite a number saying no. Uh, and then a few saying not sure or sometimes. 
if we can get a few more, oh great, we've got 55% of you that's voted. So you'll see of um, the people who voted, 70% <coughs> says we don't provide warranties, 17% um, says yes, and around 15% sometimes unsure. So thank you very much for joining me for this, to, um, for this webinar today. If you want to register for future ones, please do that. Um, if you want to look at our newsletters, videos, webinars, please feel free to do that. Um, and next month, we'll be looking at steps three and four. And again, I'll try and provide some examples to you. Thank you very much. Have a good day and we'll speak soon.